Hi ladies, welcome to Heart of the Home. Today we're going to be hearing something about worldview and we're going to be making an Oreo loaf cake. So get started, get your Bibles out and I'll see you in just a few. My heart, your home, take all of me, every part, your home, Jesus is Welcome back. Um, ladies, we are going to talk about something that is out there today. I keep hearing about it and uh, in asking the Lord what to do and what to speak on, this is something that came up in my mind that I felt like the Lord was saying, clarify it, get it, get it right, you know. So um, have you heard the terminology worldview? Well, it's all over, right? And I kind of know what worldview means, you know, you kind of hear it and you're gonna, you're, you're like, okay, I get that, you know, I understand it, but I'm going to give you a little bit more information today. And I'm going to give you information on what a Christian's worldview should be. So let's get started. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for today. We ask that you would bless this and uh, bless the women, Father. As they sit and listen, I pray that your word would go forth, Father, that your Holy Spirit would touch lives. And we just, again, Lord, thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I titled it Worldview, question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, more and more, we're being asked that precise question. What is your worldview? You hear it on the news all the time. How do you see things? And people are watching and waiting to hear the truth and falling into the lies of those who are speaking out against the truth of the Word of God. The definition of a worldview is a particular philosophy of life or conception of the world. A worldview is how you look at the world, how you think it operates, why things happen the way they do, what your purpose may be. A worldview is a collection of attitudes, values, stories, and expectations about the world around us, which dictates our every thought and action. Now, these writings and thoughts are those of unsaved, secular, worldly-influenced people. And what strikes me is the last sentence, which says, it dictates their every thought and action. What is your worldview? A personal worldview for anyone, because all people, Christian or not, have views of what we believe to be true, and what we now believe becomes the driving force behind every emotion, decision, and action. It affects your response to every area of your life. We all have one, even if you have not thought exactly what that may be, because we all gather our view by what we believe in, who we believe in, and how we believe it to work. So with that said, what is a Christian's worldview to be? Let me begin by using scripture, which is where the core of our worldview should start. Get your Bibles out, ladies. Look at Romans 12, verse 2. It says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A biblical worldview is based solely, solely, ladies, on the Word of God. This is the foundation of everything you say and do. So someone with a biblical worldview believes his primary reason for existence is to love and serve God. God's perfect will, as stated in Romans. Think about the worldview, the worldview of beauty is in the eye of the beholder which is in truth a secular open opinion that says any art piece, no matter how vulgar or abstract, would be considered art and a creation of beauty. The word states that beauty is defined, not open in any way. 1 Peter 3 through 4 says, Do not let your beauty be that outward adorning of arranging of the hair, of wearing gold, or of putting on fine apparel. 
sorry. But let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. What the world shouts at us is the opposite of what God desires, which also leads us to today's doctrine saying that you can be a girl one day and a boy the next. You can run a race as a man in a woman's sport, win first prize, and all is equal. We can participate in the Olympics as an American and then turn your back and pout about the national anthem being played. It's absolute craziness. Non-biblical beliefs are bombarding us from TV, film, music, newspapers, magazines, books, internet, schools, universities, government, and even ladies, our friends. And the enemy is seductive in drawing us in. We end up incorporating these philosophies into our personal worldviews. Sadly, we often do this without even realizing it. It happens like the frog in the pan of water. Slowly, little by little, if we continue to allow it, we get indoctrinated and all of a sudden, we can't see the truth through the trees. And the confusion of it brings depression and fear and anxiety. Okay, so then what? What is the answer? That we diligently learn and apply God's word in every area of our lives. Ladies, we can't say it enough. The word of God read daily is not just important, but life altering, life changing, and life affirming. The word of God alone will stand the unrelenting tide of our culture's non-biblical ideas. We then can make right decisions and responses where such topics like abortion and same-sex marriage, media choices, and even voting for godliness are confronted. In the end, it is our convictions passionately spoken and our actions that reveal what and who we believe in. Recently, I've noticed a trend with Christian women that speaking the truth to someone is seen as unloving and mean. Our society has us believing no matter what our opinion, action, or attitude is, is right. That's not what the word says. Be careful, ladies. We so easily take on the world's views and make them our own because for the most part, it strokes us and it's easier than a disciplined life. The word says, Hebrews 12, 11, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. If you are one who cannot be disciplined, the Lord cannot have his way in you. But with the same token, for those who have ever felt the need to speak to someone in correction, there should be the fear of the Lord. Make sure your correction is based on scripture and not on opinion. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Ladies, the word of God will train us. The word of God corrects us and reproofs us. Ask yourself these questions and check your answers with the word of God. Not opinion, but truth. Because in the end, when asked, that's all that counts. That's all that will lead others to Christ. What is your biblical response for abortion? That's a good one. Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Our God knew us even before we were born. Isaiah 49, 1b says, The Lord has called me from the womb, from the inward parts of my mother. He has made mention of my name. Psalm 139 speaks about his knowledge of us before our mothers ever even knew us. What is your biblical response to same-sex marriage or homosexuality? Genesis 2.24 says, From the beginning of creation, God made them, male and female. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 states, All the sins that keep us from heaven. Homosexuality is stated clearly as one of them. What is your biblical response to the governing rulers? 
Romans 13, 1 through 4. Let every soul or believer be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. But when asked to do anything by law that does not align with the word of God, we seek his word for, his word for truth. Acts 4.20, Peter and John, having been arrested for preaching Jesus to the people and being told not to speak of it any longer, said, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. And also in Romans 5.29, Peter says, We ought to obey God rather than men. Our point, ladies, is to be ready with a Christian worldview that directs others to Christ. Ask yourselves, what are the most pertinent questions today that might be asked of you? For 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We need to be willing and ready to give an answer that will point others to Christ. But in order to do that, we need to know the word and what it says. Read the word, ladies. Let it grow and bloom in your heart and spirit. Watch what the Lord will do. Use the resources that are at our disposal. Learn what the word teaches us on today's questions so you can be ready. And don't worry if you don't have an immediate answer. Tell them you don't know, but you'll find out and get back to them. Don't be afraid not to know something. There's a, a, a something that um, I came across when I was doing this, and the Spirit was giving this to me. And, and of course, I don't think it was by accident that I got this. Again, Anne Graham Lotz, one of her daily readings, and it came right after, the day after I had put this together. So it says, just turn on the light. Ephesians 5, 8. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. I live in the southern part of the United States. During the warmer months in particular, if I leave that porch light on at night, all sorts of moths and insects swarm it. The variety can be fascinating. In everything from large luna moths to beetles to strange green crawly things beat and flutter their way to the light. I have never stood at the door and called these insects to come or set out bait for them. All I have to do is turn on the light and they come on their own volition. By the hundreds. Moss in the midst of darkness are not attracted to more darkness. They are attracted to the light. People today living in the midst of darkness are not attracted to more darkness. They are attracted to the light. So let your light shine. Lift it high. You don't have to have a clever presentation to your witness or learn evangelist, evangelistic formulas or take a course on communicating to postmodern man. For heaven's sake, just turn on the light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for this day. We ask that you would bless these women, that this word, Lord, would go forth, Father, into their hearts, Lord, most especially, Lord, that they would truly take hold of your word, Lord, that it would penetrate their hearts, Lord, that they would be able to speak your truth, Father, to others that need the light, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Welcome back, ladies. Well, today we are going to make Oreo loaf cake by All Recipes. Um, Anyways, I was just looking at this, and there are very few uh, store-bought cookies that we purchase. Um, I usually make them, um, but I do like every once in a while Oreos and milk. It's just something that tastes delicious every once in a while. So when I saw this, I thought, an Oreo loaf cake? Oh, we're going to have to make that. And so here we go. Really easy. I've got a few things to tell you beforehand. You know... I was thinking when we were when I was getting this ready today, it's something I do for myself when I'm baking, and that is that my prep is all done beforehand. I get everything over to the area that I'm going to bake in. I get it all there. For, I hate, literally hate, going and having to go find something in the middle of my baking. So I like to have everything right there. So that's a real good 
tip for you guys. If you're baking at all or even cooking, get your things out, get prepared, get ready. It, oh, it saves so much time that way. So everything's here, everything's ready, and we're going to start with showing you what the pan is going to look like. And it is a normal loaf pan. She talks about an eight by four inch. So that's a little bit small. I Most of mine are nine by fives. I have done one, as you can see here in front of me, in a nine by five already, and it came out great. So what you do is you spray it with our wonderful Baker's Joy Spray. So you spray the pan first, which is a little different. Um, normally you spray the sheets, but this is how they tell you to do it. And it came out great. So spray the pan first with your Baker's Joy. Then you're going to use your parchment paper. And I get the parchment paper that's already cut in squares for me. It fits basically a 9 by 13 on a norm. And so what I do is I just cut it to shape in there. And, um, and what you want is you want to cut it put it on top of the already sprayed pan, and you're going to do two sides. You're gonna do this side here, and then you're gonna do the width, the length of it. And so you've got them hanging over about two inches, because what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull it up with the parchment paper out of the pan. It makes it much easier, and there's stickiness to this, so it would stick in the pan otherwise, so this just kind of carries it out. So our pan is ready. We're gonna set that to the side. The next thing we're gonna do prior to starting baking and everything else is we're going to smash our, um, our Oreos. It takes um, 15 to 16 cookies is what I found out to make at, at least a cup. Usually goes a little bit more than that. Now, the best way I know how to do this, you guys, to crunch them, you can put them in your, um, in your, um, ah, you know, blender if you wanted to or whatever. Um, but I just find when you've got something small like that to do, you get your rolling pin out, put them in a baggie, and just hit until you get them to the crushed state that you want them. So that's kind of what I was doing with mine. So I just wanted to show you that. So I've got mine already crushed and ready to go in the baggie. Those are um, 16 Oreo cookies all ready to go. So everything is pretty much ready. I've measured everything already and um, we're ready to go. So we're going to go ahead and preheat our oven at 350, which we've done. We're going to go ahead and whisk our flour, baking powder, and salt together, which I've already done here. And that is one and a half cups of all-purpose flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, and one, tea one half teaspoon of salt. And that's already all been whisked together. I'm going to leave that to the side, though, because it does say to go ahead and whisk your um, sugar, eggs, and vanilla together. So we're going to do that. We're not going to use um, um, my electric mixer today. We're going to try whisking it because she doesn't do that. She just whisks it. So we're going to do that. This is our three eggs. Um, how much? Three quarter cups of white sugar was what we put in there. And um, oil. And vanilla. And that's half a cup of oil and one teaspoon of vanilla. And it never matters at all if a little more of vanilla goes in. A lot of people like to use a lot more vanilla. So that's kind of up to you and your tastes. I'm gonna set that aside. Okay, so let's just go ahead and whisk this up real quick. And it always helps ladies to have all of your dairy product out for about half an hour prior to baking because it not only mixes better, but it, um, just in cooking, same, same as cooking. Like if you've got hamburgers and they've been in the fridge, you know, you're waiting to use them, take them out a half an hour before because it cooks better all the way through. So when you've got cold, it just doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, mix as well. And so we're just going to mix it really good. Until the sugar is really incorporated. Really, that's what you want to see, is that the sugar is not real crystallized still. 
Man, you got to have good, strong arms to do this. <laughs> I am not doing the best job. I've seen people whisk really fast and good. But that's about it. That's good. So now we're going to go ahead and um, add our sour cream. Yeah, I thought that was it. Now, this is the fun part. I received just the neatest gift um, at church one Sunday about a month ago. And... Um, this uh, family that we have in our church, um, their husband, John, um, is one of our servants at church, really neat guy. And he, on the side, um, makes things. And I've seen knives that he's made out of wood. Um, beautiful. Uh, my grandson was privy to one of those gifts. Anyways, he came up to me at church and handed, the, he said I made, well, actually his son, was funny because he said my dad made you something and he knows how I like to bake and how I like to we, we have this going on and so he handed me these and I have to show you my sour cream is in two of them so you're not gonna see until I get the sour cream out these are myrtle wood um, Aren't they beautiful? He made them. He welded all of it and made them all. So I've got a full set of measuring cups made from his myrtle wood. And I mean, I'm not kidding you. What a treasure, right? So I'm just uh, just loving using them. I've got my three quarter cups of sour cream in them right now, which is half a cup and a quarter cup. That's how you measure three quarters when you've got that. Um, those measurements. So we're gonna go ahead and add our sour cream now to it. And they're just beautiful to handle too. The, they're rounded and just beautiful. I was so excited. <laughs> so, most of you don't know, but I collect measuring cups. Isn't that funny that you think that I would collect measuring cups <laughs> and measuring spoons, I love them. So, um, anyways, it was, he had no idea. He was, he goes, what? I said, yeah, I collect them. So, anyways. Okay, that's our sour cream, three quarters of a cup, and we're going to mix that in real good with our egg and sugar mixture. Unless I break the darn thing. And you're getting a nice creamy yellow, you know, real pretty yellow color out of it. Now you're going to go ahead and add and whisk in. Actually, I think it says fold in. Let me make sure. Uh, mix together with a rubber spatula. So we're gonna get rid of our, um, our whisk. Put that over here. And we're gonna use our spatula to mix in our flour ingredients, which is the flour, the salt, and the baking powder. And we're just going to mix it in until it just gets mixed, you know, because you, when you overbeat anything, um, when the flour gets to it, you create gluten, which is not a good thing in your baking. So you don't want to over, ever over mix your flour when you get that in. You can mix your eggs until they're frothy and wonderful and lemony looking and all of that. But you don't want to do that with the flour once that gets in. So right now that looks pretty good. You can kind of see lumps in there a little bit, but that's all right, not a problem. So <clears throat> the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna add your one cup of um, Oreos. Where did I put that? Okay. And we're gonna use our new measuring cup here and grab a cup of Crushed Oreos, okay, and we're going to just dump those in, and what I decided to do, I made this before, you can see it right here, that's what it looks like on the inside in case you can see, but it's delicious. So anyways, my grandsons and my son-in-law have already had some. So um, anyways, that was that's it for the recipe, but... I decided, you know, I can't just leave something alone, right? So I decided to add a cup of chocolate chips to it too, just to make it a little bit sweeter and a little bit chocolatier. 
And what's wrong with that, right? And I, you can even, even, I was thinking about this. I thought, um, I have a container in there with some Girl Scout mint, ch mint cookies, you know, those chocolate covered mint cookies. You could do that here instead of Oreos and do mint chocolate chips and make it a mint one if you wanted to. You could even do that with peanut butter chips. So you could really change this up any way you wanted. This is not necessary, but it's really going to be good. So we're just going to add that to it. And then we're going to pour it into our pan because it is completely ready. It's very easy. Um, the hard part is, and I'm going to tell you in a minute, because um, once we get this going, okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to dump this in here in your pan, all of it, into your pan. Then spread it out. Just spread it evenly out, okay? And then it's gonna go into the oven. 350, it says um, 40 to 50 minutes, I think is what she says. No, loaf pans, you guys, always take at least an hour. I'm gonna say 60 minutes to 70 minutes is what I would tell you. Start looking at it around 60 minutes and it should be just about well done. It gets a real dark brown because you've gotta, you gotta cook it through. So, you know, bread loaves like that get a little well done on the outside, but that's okay, they still taste delicious. So anyways, that's ready to go in, but let me go to this real quick. Okay, this is done. Let's just say it's done and out of the oven. The topping is not on it yet. This was a little difficult to put on the topping. And she says, just, um, you know, uh, as soon as it comes out, put your chocolate chips and your um, white chocolate on top. And, you know, it should melt to it. Well, it doesn't, it falls off to the side. So what I had to do was take each one melt it on the pan and stick it to the stick it to the sides and stuff so that it would melt so i decided the best way to do this you guys is um, melt your white chocolate and your chocolate in the microwave for just a few minutes till it's nice and soft and runny and just um, put it on your cake that way you know melted and ready to go crisscrossed whatever which way you want to go It'll make, a, it'll make your life a lot easier. And then on top of that, you put the Oreo cookies on top of it. It'll be really pretty. And then powdered sugar. <laughs> so that's what it looks like, the finished product. We have a picture of it online for you. Hope you enjoy it and have a blessed day. Mm -hmm.